So we were talking about barrier method for linear programming, particularly using logarithmic barrier in the previous class. So we defined the following quantities. Or let me write the optimization problem first. So we want to minimize C transpose X such that X is greater than or equal to zero, AX equal to B. And so we defined our set capital X as X in RN, AX equal to B. And S has X in RN, X in capital X, X strictly greater than zero. Uh, what else? My F epsilon X was defined as C transpose X minus summation log of XI. Okay, so these were the things we defined in the previous class. And if I trace, if I uh, draw the set capital X, um, actually capital S, it would look something like, something like this. Let's say this is the point X star zero, which is the optimal solution. And I'm starting at X star infinity, which is the central point, and there is a central path that goes to x star zero, so each of these points is x star epsilon for a specific value of epsilon. Okay, so this is what we did in the previous class, this is just a recap, and the idea we started with, or the idea of this using this barrier approach for the linear programming case is instead of trying to compute x star epsilon and then reducing the value of epsilon, uh, we would like to trace the central path approximately. Not exactly, but approximately. What that means is, I'll start from some initial condition in the set, and then I'm going to do certain gradient descent or Newton's <coughs> method type iterations to get closer to some x star epsilon naught. And then after that, I'm just going to trace this path approximately and get closer to x0 star after a certain number of steps. Okay, so we don't need to trace the central path exactly, we just have to trace it approximately. That's the idea. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> So my x star epsilon is argmin x in s f epsilon of x. Okay, any questions so far? Yes. Well, so this is a linear program, so x always will be at the corner, the x star. There will be a corner which, is, which will be the optimal solution, assuming there is an optimal solution for this, right? So that's why I'm drawing the corner here. Uh, but the, the theorem, the main result is that this sort of log barrier approach will converge to one optimal solution to the linear programming problem, okay? Yes? So this is how we defined the set S in the previous class. So this is a recap. Remember we required G of X strictly less than zero. So in this case, G of X is minus X, which in we need strictly less than zero. Okay, that's how we defined the set S in the previous class. Okay. Uh, the reason why you need this to be strictly less than zero is because when x is equal to zero, this term will be infinity. So it's not, the function is not well-defined at the boundary, but it is well-defined 
everywhere away from the boundary inside the set. OK. So we want to do a Newton's iteration in this case, because we know that from our experience that Newton's iteration is much faster. So let's do a Newton's iteration. So every time I'm taking this step, it's a Newton's uh, step. So how would you compute a Newton's step for a constraint optimization problem? So it's given by, so let's say I'm at x. We are at x, and parameter is epsilon. OK, so some x and some epsilon greater than 0. Um, you could pick epsilon equals to 10. You could pick epsilon equals to 500. Uh, it doesn't matter, OK? You just have to pick a positive number. Your d star for the Newton's method would be argmin d in Rn. d transpose second derivative d such that ad equal to 0. OK, this is exactly the same as what you used in the manifold suboptimization method also. OK, can we solve this problem by hand? Come on. <laughs> can we solve this problem by hand? Sorry? Oh, come on. <laughs> you've done this in your uh, manifolds of optimization, right? You've, you've solved this problem by hand in the manifolds of optimization method, uh, where this was identity. This was some gradient of f, and this was a k. Okay, so you know that we can solve it by hand, and the solution is as follows. In order to introduce the solution, I need to introduce some notation. So I'm going to define. Okay, I'm going to define. So what is my gradient of f epsilon of x? It's c one minus. epsilon over x1, cn minus epsilon over xn, right? That's my uh, gradient of f, epsilon. So I want to write it in a compact form, because I cannot be writing such long expressions everywhere. So let me define capital X as x1, xn. So this is just diagonal of the vector x, and it's a positive definite matrix. And let me define E to be 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 in Rn. Okay, so this is diagonal of x. This is a vector 1 in Rn. Now I can compute the derivative easily. I can write the first derivative as c minus epsilon x inverse e. Right? What about the second derivative? What's the second derivative of the function f epsilon? Epsilon x square.
Oh, minus, yeah, minus 2, sorry, minus 2. Okay, all of you agree with the first derivative and second derivative? Okay, so now we can solve this problem by hand. I need to define lambda as a x square a transpose inverse a x c minus epsilon no x c minus epsilon e Okay, and I need to write my d star, so let me write it here. Minus x q x epsilon, where q x epsilon is x c minus a transpose lambda over epsilon minus e. So it's a fairly long set of expressions, but that's what we have. Okay, I have, you have a question? No? Okay. So I have a question to you. What happens when x is equal to x star epsilon? What's the value of qx epsilon? Oh, sorry. So the question is qx star epsilon epsilon equals to what? Zero? Why should it be zero? That's the right answer, but why? Because you're at the optimal point, you don't have to move anywhere. That's right. Okay, so you are at the op so okay, so his argument is if I take x to be x star epsilon, which means I'm exactly at this point, uh, if I try to solve this problem, it's going to be equal to the optimal solution d star is going to be equal to zero because you're already at the optimal point. You don't have to take the d star has to be equal to zero because the Newton step is going to be zero. And since d star is zero, x is a positive definite matrix, this must be equal to zero, right? Okay, so all of you agree with this argument? So when you are at the optimal point, x star epsilon, the d star must necessarily be zero, and if d star is zero, then that means q of x epsilon must be equal to zero. So this is actually, equal to zero. Okay. Now what happens, so my next question is, so I know that Q of X star epsilon, well, whatever this quantity is, it's equal to zero here. What happens close to this point? Sorry? So, Let's look at q of x epsilon. 
is it a continuous function of x? So this is a continuous function of x. This lambda is a continuous function of x. E is of course a constant, C is a constant, A is a constant, epsilon is a constant. Right? So Q of x epsilon seems to be a continuous, not seems to be, it is a continuous function of x. Now if it is equal to 0 at this point, then it must be close to 0 in a small neighborhood around x star epsilon. Right? That's reasonable to uh, assume because we know that this, this is map as a function of x is continuous. Okay. So the idea is as follows. I will, so I cannot compute the distance to x star epsilon, right? That's kind of uh, difficult to compute the distance because we don't know what x star epsilon is. But we still want to know when are we close to the central path and when are we far away from the central path. So one way to measure the closeness without actually having a real metric is to just look at the value of q, q of x epsilon. If it is close to 0, you are close to the central path. If you are far from 0, you are far from the central path. Okay? It's not a metric, by the way. This is not a metric, but it tells you how far or close you are to the central path. The good thing is you really need to compute qx epsilon in order to compute d star. So you're not doing any extra work to know how far you are from the central path. It's just part of your solution. You just look at the magnitude of q of x epsilon. If it is small, close to the central path. If it is big, you're far away from the central path. OK? So I hope I have convinced you that looking at q x epsilon is a good idea for trying to trace the central path approximately. OK, good. So I see some nodding heads, so therefore, I guess you are convinced. So you said that when we are at the optimal point, the d star is zero. The d star is zero, yes. But what if we are at the abs, abs, x epsilon? At this point? Yeah, but d star is, is not zero. Right? Why should d star be non-zero? So if you are at the optimal point, where would the Newton's step direct you towards? Right? So x star epsilon is the optimal point when you have picked epsilon as your parameter. Right? So we have picked epsilon throughout the, epsilon is fixed in this entire calculation. Okay? So we are not changing the value of epsilon. Yes? E is all one, right? Yeah, E is all one. But it's a, it's a vector in Rn, so it's like n ones stacked as a column vector. Okay, so here are, the, here are the two facts, no, not two, but three claims that I'm going to write without proving, and I'm going to erase this side. Okay, so the first claim is something that we just uh, talked about. The second claim is important. If x is greater than 0, ax equal to b,
Oh, I, and also Okay, so what does this uh, second claim tells us? I am in the interior of the set, so x is strictly positive, ax is equal to b, so I am on this manifold, and I am close to the central path, okay? And I compute d star according to that formula, then my distance to the central path is less than equal to my original distance square. Now remember that this is strictly less than one. So this distance is much, much smaller, okay? So if this was 0 0.5, this distance is 0 0.25 or less than 0 0.25. And moreover, X plus D star also lies in the set capital S, which means that X plus D star is strictly positive and AX plus D star is equal to B. Okay, so pictorially, what this means is, I am close to the central path, okay? So my Qx epsilon is less than one, the magnitude is less than one, and I take one Newton step, just one Newton step, okay? I get much closer to the central path. Let's say this is my x star epsilon. Okay, that's the second claim. And I'm, I'm still within the set, I'm not going out of the set. So that's a good property. Any question on this? Uh, yes. So remember in Newton's method, typically the error is, it has a super linear convergence rate. So it's, it's because of that reason. There is no alpha for the D star, it's like... Yes, so the D star is, e alpha will be equal to one. If we were going out of the set, if this condition did not hold, then you have to pick an alpha so that you are in the set. In this situation, you're, you're already in the set, so you don't have to take any alpha. Or I, I shouldn't say you don't have to take any alpha, alpha is equal to one here, okay? All right, so once I get close to the central path, what do I need to do? Reduce epsilon, right? I need to pick an epsilon which is smaller than the original epsilon I started with. So that's the third claim, which is if x is positive, ax is equal to b, q of x epsilon less than one, no, less is less than equal to gamma, which is strictly less than one, Then I'm going to pick delta equals to or delta less than equal to gamma one minus gamma over one plus gamma and epsilon bar is equal to one minus delta over square root of n epsilon.
Okay. So the next result is, I have come to this point, I now need to figure out how to reduce the value of epsilon so that, uh, so that I can proceed with the, uh, with the idea of tracing the central path. And here is, an, here is a neat idea. So if your Q of X epsilon is less than or equal to gamma, which is strictly less than one, okay, then you can pick delta, which is uh, a function of gamma, Okay, so you can pick any value of delta, and you pick epsilon bar, which depends on delta in a specific manner, but it's still epsilon bar is strictly less than epsilon. Okay, so if you pick epsilon bar in that way, then your x plus d star comma epsilon bar is also less than equal, well, there has to be a norm here. So the norm of q of x plus d star comma epsilon bar is still, still less than equal to gamma. So I started from here, pictorially, okay? Started from here, I took a Newton step. I now need to reduce the value of epsilon, so I pick epsilon bar, and I picked epsilon bar in such a manner that this point is close to x star plus, x star over, no, x star of epsilon bar, okay? So this is the new point that I want to get to, but this point is close to this point. I again have to take just one Newton step in this direction, and then I change the value of epsilon bar again, and then so on and so forth, okay? So I continue this idea over and over again, and eventually I'll converse to x zero star as k goes to infinity, okay? So let me go over it once more. So this one says, so this one says that Let's just look at the magnitude of Q and that will give you some idea about how close you are to the central path. This one says if you are close to the central path, you take a Newton step, you are even closer to the central path. And you're not going out of the set, out of the constraint region. This one says if you are close to the central path, you can change your epsilon in a specific manner so that you still remain close to the central path at the new optimal point. Okay. So this leads to an algorithm which is as follows. I'm going to erase this part. So I need to trace the central path. I start with some initial condition x0 but I'm, I don't know where I am in, uh, along the central path, okay? So I may be far away, I may be close, I just don't know. So I take several Newton step to get close to the central path, and then I check whether this condition is satisfied or not. That becomes my x1. If this condition is satisfied, I take one Newton step, I reach x2, <coughs> And then I reduce the value of epsilon in this fashion. And then I take another Newton step. I reach x3, x4, x5, and so on. Okay. Okay, so after you reach x1, x2, then change epsilon 2 equals to epsilon 1, 1 minus delta over square root of n, compute d2 star, arrive at x3, and continue this uh, iteration. Yes. 
initial x0, you just have to pick something that meets the x greater than 0 constraint and ax equal to b. So for that, so so far we have never talked about how to pick x0 because for every problem it's going to be different. So MATLAB has to make an initial guess and perhaps do some iterations in the beginning to pick an appropriate value of x0. Uh, sorry, I meant epsilon, the epsilon one. Oh, epsilon 0 or 1? Yeah, you just pick it arbitrarily, some initial value. 50, 100, whatever works for your problem. Questions? Oh yeah, so when do you, t oh good, that, that leads me to the next uh, claim. So final claim. If x is positive, ax equal to b, qx epsilon less than 1, then C transpose x minus f star is less than equal to n plus square root of n. f star is the optimal value of the original problem. Okay, so if your qx epsilon is less than 1 and you, let's say you want to have a tolerance of uh, 10 raised to minus 5 and your dimension n is equal to 100, then you just want to go all the way until epsilon becomes something of the order of 10 raised to minus 7 or somewhere around that number. Okay. So that's, that would be your termination criteria. It depends on what your tolerance is, okay? How much error you would like to tolerate in the current value and the optimal value. Okay? N is the dimension of X. N is the dimension of X, okay? So the salient feature of this algorithm is that except for the initial time when you have to spend a couple of, not a couple, but a few iterations in order to get closer to the central path, you're always taking only one Newton step, okay? One Newton step, change epsilon, another Newton step, change epsilon, again one Newton step, change epsilon, and so on. That's how this algorithm proceeds. And this is known as a short step method, okay, short step method because you just take one step at every point of time, one Newton step at every point of time. What's the benefit of short step method? Any idea? What would the benefit of short step method be? Yes. Yeah, let me let me qualify. You you are you are quite there, but not uh, strictly speaking, not there yet. So the the real reason why short step method is useful is because you can do the exact calculation of how many iterations you need to take in order to reach x naught star. Okay, that's why short step method is useful. Um, so in the worst case, your performance is guaranteed in short step method. Okay, so if, you, if I give you the worst possible instance of linear program, you will be 
you will you will have a guarantee on the number of iterations you need in order to get close to x naught star so it has the best theoretical performance guarantee so far there is another variant called long step method where instead of picking epsilon bar according to this fashion you reduce epsilon bar to a much lower value in which case you cannot get close to the central path um, within one iterations you might have to take a few iterations in order to get close to the central path okay and that is known as long step method in which you change epsilon aggressively and then take multiple newton step okay so in short, short step method you reduce the value of epsilon according to some fashion and then you just take one newton step in the long step method you change the value of epsilon aggressively so epsilon 2 equals to epsilon over 5 and then you have to take like four or five newton step in order to get close to the central path okay long step method appears to be superior in practice because you are not always solving the worst possible instance of linear programming problem you always have certain structure and therefore your long step method seems to be much better in practice in terms of getting to the optimal solution okay right so if you start with epsilon equals to 100 you are here but every time if you reduce the value of epsilon by a factor of 5 you can get to a tolerance of 10 raised to minus 5 or 10 raised to minus 10 much faster than if you had reduced epsilon according to this fashion uh but the problem is you can't really do a theoretical analysis of how many steps it is going to take to reach the optimal solution because you don't know how many newton step you need to take at every iteration all right so this method was developed around 1984 by a scientist named karmarkar I tried to read his paper it was too dense I I just couldn't follow so I just stick to Bertsekers and this is much nicer to read what this method is Okay any question so far Yes I mean I'm sure somebody would have implemented it but I just don't know about it. Yeah. You know the good thing with optimization algorithms is you could come up with your own variants right which would have which may or may not perform well it's unclear unless you have certain structure that you can exploit to prove that it has certain performance guarantees. Okay so I want to show what the long step method would look like So you start from some x not you take several newton step to reach close to the central path then you pick so this one was your x epsilon 1 this is your x star epsilon 2 so you reduce the value of epsilon 2 aggressively then you have to take several newton step to reach close to x star epsilon 2 okay and so on so that's how you get close to that's how you get close to your x star 0 So you have to take several newton step in the intermediate steps in, in in the intermediate stages
Okay. All right. So that's the end of barrier method. The next topic would be augmented Lagrangian method, where we attempt to solve optimization problems with equality constraint. So if there are no further questions, I'm going to erase the board. How will you how will you start at x infinity star? Just solve the minus log. I don't know. Why would you think it's easy to compute? But the but the constraint set is pretty. So the constraint set is x greater than zero, a x equal to b. So even if you have a convex problem, you have to use certain algorithm to solve it. Um, yeah, there is no way you can get an analytical result for x star infinity. Okay, in terms of just a, b, and uh, that's it. A and b are the only two parameters. So, any other question? Okay, so in barrier method, we were trying to solve problems with inequality constraints. Uh, now we are interested in solving problems of this type. I want to minimize fx such that h of x equal to zero and x lies in, x lies in some set capital X. Okay, h is a function from Rn to Rm. <coughs> My question is, let me make the following change. I want to minimize fx plus c over two norm of hx square such that hx equal to zero, x is in capital X. Are these two optimization problems equivalent? Would they have the same optimal solution? Right? So I'm constraining myself to be at hx equal to zero. So actually this term doesn't really participate in optimization because it's always equal to zero. But this is reminiscent of the penalty approach where you penalize moving away from the constraint set. Um, and our algorithm would try to solve problems of this type. So we would like to minimize the Lagrangian for solving the first order necessary condition for optimality for this particular problem. And we know that this problem is equivalent to this problem. So if we can find an optimal solution to this problem, I can actually find an optimal solution to the problem that we started with. So what's the Lagrangian for this second problem? Let's write the expression. Okay, so this was the penalty approach, if you remember, and we had the uh, penalty function indexed by a natural number k in the proof of Lagrange multiplier theorem, but here we are just fixing it to be some constant c. That's my penalty term. This is the usual Lagrangian term. This is the usual Lagrangian term. 
and this is known as augmented Lagrangian. Yes. Yes. This is a different optimization problem. If you, take away the if you re remove this constraint or what? Yes. Oh, yeah, of course. If you remove this constraint, then it's a different optimization problem. Uh, no, you cannot. Yeah. So let's think about the idea, okay? So for C very small, of course, we know that it's not the same optimization problem because you're moving away from the constraint surface. But if C is very, very large, uh, this term will dominate this particular optimization term. And so you are essentially just trying to find a feasible point, not the optimal point to the original problem. So you may land up somewhere else in the feasible set, okay? All right, now here is another question. If lambda was equal to lambda star, so somebody told me what the lambda star for this optimization problem is, the original optimization problem is, then LC of x star lambda star, or rather the gradient, will be equal to zero, right? Which means that all we need to do is, if, I, if somebody told me lambda star, all I need to do is um, find the point which satisfies this stationarity condition, okay? First order necessary condition for optimality. I just need to find that point and we know that it will satisfy the first order necessary condition for this problem. But this requires some prior information about lambda star, so that's not very helpful. The second idea is let CK go to infinity as we move into the optimization problem. Just like in this case, we were picking epsilon K going to zero, here we will index the algorithm by CK and we'll let it go to infinity. Okay, and then you can create a hybrid method where you estimate the value of lambda star as you increase the value of CK. Okay, so that would be a hybrid method and that's known as method of multipliers. Okay. So the idea is clear, we want to solve problems of this type with equality constraint. We look at an augmented problem uh, where we know for sure that neither the optimal value nor the optimal solutions are going to change if we move from this problem to this problem. And then we constructed the augmented Lagrangian for this problem. And then we have two thoughts. One is if I'm close to lambda star, all I need to do is look for the point at which the gradient of lambda c becomes equal to zero. So that's one idea. The other approach is I will let this penalty go to infinity uh, and then compute, compute x bar such that gradient of LCK uh, compute the stationary point of gradient of LCK, and hopefully this X bar K will converge to X star, which satisfies the first order necessary condition for optimality. Yes? Does C take negative No, C cannot take negative value. C has to be positive. Okay, it has to do, C ha it has to do with uh, making this function uh, convex around the constraint surface, okay? So we can't take C to be 
positive, uh, negative. It has to be positive. <coughs> okay. So that's all I have for today. We are going to talk about these two methods in the next class.